Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Temple Institute Parsha class. My name is Gedalia Meyer, and I'm podcasting from Maale Dumim in Israel. Change is the great constant in life. We look for stability in much of life, but what we get is change. This pattern unfolds upon us from the moment of birth. If we are fortunate, we are provided with a stable environment of nourishment and love, the perfect world for a baby to grow and develop. But within all that stability are changes that happen so fast that they seem like the camera has been set to a higher speed than normal. Before this child knows it, he or she is a teen, equipped with a body and mind that is almost ready to meet the world on their own. For that entire time, this child wishes for nothing else but stability. In spite of this, or perhaps because of it, the changes keep coming. From toddler through early childhood to young adulthood, this person undergoes changes that would baffle a full-grown adult. In a span of about a dozen years, their body has changed to an unrecognizable form, and their mind has gone through so many transitions that they have trouble, trouble figuring out who they really are. While that young man or woman can still remember playing with toys, they are thinking about career choices and mulling over beliefs about the world. It is a whirlwind of changes within a veneer of stability, enough to make anybody's head spin. With full adulthood, things begin to, to both slow down and speed up. The physical changes slow considerably, but degrees of independence instill another round of psychological and personal change. This is the time when that person must find who they are and where they fit in the world. They might move to several different places, even to different parts of the world. They might change their religious beliefs, their social or political affiliations. All this is thrust upon them like a menu at a restaurant with too many options. But these choices have to be made whether they like it or not, for this is life. It is in the realm of beliefs that the greatest and most profound changes take place from that point on until the onset of old age. Beliefs are strange animals. They form the core of who we are and yet can seem as whimsical as scrolling through Facebook posts. We usually don't want to change our beliefs, but when we look back after decades of supposed stability, we may find that we have changed right under our noses. Those beliefs are, in a sense, our reality. They may not fo form the earth under our feet or the form that our physical bodies take, but they sure dictate how we see that earth and that body. They shape our understanding and our choices of everything from who we love or hate to God. This week's Parsha is called Bamidbar. It is the first Parsha in the next book of the Bible, also called by the same name, but more familiar to English speakers as Numbers. Bamidbar means in the wilderness, a reference to the wilderness of the Sinai Desert where the Israelites would spend the next 38 or so years wandering around as they made their way to the Promised Land. The name Numbers comes from the fact that two different senses occur in this book. The first one in, in, this, in this very Parsha. We are going to skip discussion of this rather long Parsha because the biblical holiday of Shavuot, or weeks, will fall this Sunday evening. This holiday is the third of the so-called pilgrimage festivals, the other two being Pesach and Sukkot. Those other two are each a week long, while Shavuot is only one day. Nothing much ha really happens on Shavuot, unlike its better-known siblings, and unlike the very Jewish Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Hence, it tends to get overlooked on the Jewish calendar and ignored in the grand scheme of things. It is not even as well known as the more minor holidays of Purim and Hanukkah. Shavuot is a classic agricultural celebration that was changed over the centuries into a completely different commemoration. For at least 2,000 years, Jews have celebrated it as the day which marks the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai. Whether it always marked this event is a matter of speculation and tradition. Whatever the case, Jews today concentrate their focus on studying some aspect of Torah, Torah wisdom or law frequently committing themselves to go the entire night until morning prayers. This is followed by what has become mandatory in Jewish settings, a dairy spread filled with all manner of cheesecake. In the middle of what amounts to a good deal of prayer following what may have been an all-nighter of Torah study, there is the reading of a very short book of the Bible. This is the book of Ruth, a simple story of a young widow who follows her mother-in-law named Naomi 
back to Israel from the neighboring land of Moab, which is now Jordan. Ruth herself was from Moab, but she married Naomi's son after the family left Israel during the famine. Eventually, both Naomi's and Ruth's husbands died, along with the husband of Ruth's sister-in-law, Orpah. The three women were left on their own, a highly undesirable fate in the biblical world of 3,000 years ago. After these deaths, Naomi decided to return to her homeland, which she hadn't seen for 10 years. She told her daughters-in-law to return to their ancestral homes and their ancient gods, since they would not find anything resembling either in Israel. They insist that they want to return with her. It is only with, what, with much persuasion that she manages to convince Orpah to return home. Their parting is sad and it is obvious that much love has developed between them. But Ruth refuses to return. She insists that she will go with Naomi to Israel and live there as an Israelite, however rare and difficult this was at the time. Naomi tries to make her see the impossibility of this roll of the dice. She would have limited prospects of marriage, and her life would forever be one of an outsider. But Ruth sticks to her guns, and in the course of a few short verses becomes the classic biblical example of a convert. Although she is never called the classic Jewish word for a convert, she has since become enshrined as the prototype of this experience. She commits herself to following the practices and beliefs of Naomi's people, come hell or high water. In this regard, Ruth is a heroine in a class by herself among the legendary figures of the Bible. In the course of the rest of this short book, she manages to find a place among the female gleaners of a man named Boaz, who is a relative of Naomi. After a brief hint at a sexual encounter in a barn during the night, she marries him. With him, she bears a son named Obed, to the great acclaim and blessings of all the women who attended the birth. This Ovid in turn sires Yishai, who in turn sires none other than David, the future king of Israel. Thus, the story takes Ruth through a full spectrum of life's ups and downs, from a forsaken widow who takes the wild chance of joining a different people with different beliefs who will likely reject her, to scrounging a living by gleaning in the fields, to becoming the ancestress of the greatest king of ancient Israel. It is a little difficult to know what the actual point of this story is. Is it to in introduce the ancestry of David? Is it to illustrate the biblical experience of conversion to belief in the Israelite God? Is it to depict the simple dedication to a personal choice? Or is it just to tell the story with no point whatsoever? It could be all of these or none. The story tells itself and we the readers have to figure out the message for ourselves. Perhaps there is a subtle message in the, this somewhat uneventful story, at least by biblical standards. Perhaps the message includes all of the above and something else that flits through them all and above them all. This is the story of a young woman. She lived in the world of the Bible 3,000 years ago when life revolved around the seasons and the harvest and plagues and famines. Wandering beyond the nearest river was a long journey. Living in a foreign land was risky to the point of recklessness. It probably meant enslavement or worse. Changing one's religious beliefs was simply not an option. It was as un unlikely as changing one's sex or the color of one's eyes. It couldn't be done except under great duress, like war or some other strategy. To abandon one's ancestral home without any need other than personal choice was the height of foolishness. It was a form of cultural suicide that almost nobody risked. Ruth is one of only two in the Bible, and the other is almost unknown. But Ruth did all of that and survived. Although it is not stated as such, she was rewarded with a son who became the grandfather of the future king of Israel. What could account for such a titanic shift in her fate? She was born into a people who were the almost perpetual enemies of the Israelites. She probably had little to no contact with them. She may have never heard of them until she married one. She certainly had never considered returning to live among them and adopting their beliefs. But this is precisely what happened to her. And it happened so naturally that one feels the script had been written for her from before she was born. It is almost biblical in its preordained feel. All these changes happened to Ruth like she was playing a part in a movie. 
but the choices were hers almost every step of the way. Ruth is the story of change. It is life flowing under us like a river, set in its course, but always moving somewhere else. It tells us that our fate is as set as the course of that river and as flexible as the water we feel moving around us in every direction as we stand in it. Our expectations may be fulfilled or something else entirely unexpected may happen to us. Either way, it is the story of our lives. We may make decisions that steer the course of our lives, or things may happen to us that radically change our fate that have nothing to do with personal choices. Those changes are the story of our lives. The single facet of our lives that we can truly have influence over is our beliefs. They are a subset of our choices, the relatively small collection that defines how we see the world. Ruth took the radical move of choosing to change her fundamental religious beliefs. This was unusual at the time, but it was somewhat more common today. She set a kind of biblical precedent for the entire future, that as haphazard as the changes in our lives appear to be, some are under our control. We can decide our most profound and fundamental beliefs. We can choose to be who we are in whom we shall become. Shabbat Shalom.